You know, growing up in a Southern Baptist church, most of what I heard when we would talk about communion is something like, well, communion is just a symbol. Um, you know, communion is only a symbol. It's just a moment maybe where we take to think and reflect on Jesus' atoning death for us on the cross. But whenever we would talk about communion, it was almost always in terms of what communion was not. You know, I would mostly hear things like, okay, well, you know, we, we don't think that communion saves you. You know, we don't believe in transubstantiation. And of course, you know, the never ending refrain, well, and we don't want to do this too often um, because that might become an empty ritual. And so the question I always had growing up, maybe it's a question you've had, is, uh, well, why do we do it at all then? Um, what's the point of communion? Um, what is the significance of it? I never had a great understanding of why Jesus asked us to do this why he used the elements that he did and what meaning it is supposed to have. So I, I don't know your background. I don't know what you've been taught or grew up believing about communion or if you've given it much thought at all. Um, but this morning as we come to chapter 22 in the Gospel of Luke, we're going to be at the Last Supper where Jesus is going to institute communion. And so I want to spend some time just talking about what communion really means. Um, we're going to have five points this morning, which seems like a lot. I wanted to have 20, but Bree told me that was too many, um, and I could have turned it into a whole sermon series, but I thought we've been in Luke long enough, so we'll just, you get five. Um, but my hope is that after today, uh, we'll all have a little bit of a better understanding of what communion really means and why Jesus gave it to us. And so if you're able, if you would stand with me for the reading of God's Word in Luke chapter 22, we're going to be in the first 20 verses. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. And he went away and conferred with the chief priests and the officers that he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him some money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Then came the day of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And they said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? And he said, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished, and prepare it there. And they went, and they found it, just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, he reclined at the table. And the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The grass withers and the flower fades, but God's word stands forever. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would be here this morning, that you would help us to understand um, what you mean in your word, uh, what the significance of this meal was when you did it, and what the significance still is for us this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. Why don't you take a seat? Our first point, and we'll be here for a while. Some of these points will get a little faster as we go. But our first point is that communion um, reinterprets Passover. So one of the things that communion means is that communion is a reinterpretation of Passover. The entire backdrop of this passage is Passover. The author has gone to great lengths to make sure that we understand that this meal is not just taking place at Passover time, but in the Passover meal. Because Passover is one of the most significant days in the Jewish calendar. It's their July 4th, Christmas, and Easter all rolled up into one. This is the day that they remember how God took them out of slavery in Egypt. And as they eat this meal, they retell the story of Passover. And, but Jesus now, what he's going to do is while they eat this meal, he's going to tell a different story. And he really wants them to eat a different kind of meal. And he is going to reinterpret what Passover means for them. In verse 1, it says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover, right? So we're in the final days of Jesus' life. Um, his death is coming very soon, and it's going to come on Passover. 
Everyone's getting ready and making preparations, but some aren't preparing rightly. And two, it tells us the chief priests, the scribes, they're looking to how to put Jesus to death, for they feared the people. They're preparing to kill Jesus. They're actively planning and figuring out. They're no longer just talking or grumbling or complaining. Now they are plotting to kill Jesus as soon as they can. They've had enough. And three tells us that Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. Judas is going to be a part of this plan as well. Judas is also making his own preparations, and he's planning to betray the Lamb of God. But it has something strange here right away. It tells us Satan enters into Judas. We don't get a full picture of what that means. Don't get a complete explanation of what that looks like or how that works. It doesn't seem like Judas is completely possessed by a demon, but it does seem that Judas is being filled by Satan. I think similarly in the way that Christians are meant to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Judas seems to be filled with Satan. There's something else going on here. I don't think um, this verse here needs to give us any kind of anxiety. I don't think we've got to be worried um, that the average person is going to be filled or possessed by Satan. Um, the point of this passage isn't trying to teach us demonic possession. The point is trying to tell us, hey, we're at the climax of the story now. Um, the whole point of the Jewish calendar, right, is building towards Passover as the big celebration. And Jesus' whole story through Luke has been building towards this moment when he comes to Jerusalem and comes to the cross. And now Satan himself is coming into the story to conspire again to try and kill Jesus. If this, the Gospel of Luke was a movie and you were falling asleep, this would be the point. You need to wake up because stuff's about to happen. Satan's back. Verse 4, it tells us, And he went away, and he confers with the chief priests and officers how he might betray them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray them in the absence of a crowd. Judas is willing to help for a fee. He's willing to betray God, the God who's given him everything, the God who loves him, and he will betray God for 30 pieces of silver. So God's enemies are happy. They're looking for a chance to kill Jesus, and they want to kill him when there's not a lot of people around. So Judas is on the lookout for when will Jesus be alone. So in their Passover plans is not to remember what Jesus and what God has done for them. They're going to try to kill God instead. It's not what you should be doing on Passover. Um, verse 7 comes, and it came to the day of the unleavened bread in which Passover lamb has to be sacrificed. So this is the day where everyone goes to the temple with their lamb and they have it sacrificed. And it tells us this again to make sure that we know this is the day that this is taking place and trying to help us know that Jesus really is the Passover lamb. Jesus is the sinless and the spotless lamb who is going to be sacrificed very soon. And so Jesus tells Peter and John, you know, go prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. Jesus calls two of his most trusted disciples to make the preparations. He does not call Judas. Why? Right? Because Judas is trying to catch him. And so someone has to go get in the line of the temple to sacrifice the lamb, and somebody has to go find a place so they can figure out where they're going to have this meal so that they can be safe, so Jesus can observe this before the end. And Jesus wants them to prepare the Passover lamb, and he is preparing himself as the Passover lamb for them. Then Jesus gives these kind of weird instructions, right? He says, they ask, okay, well, where do you want us to do this? And he said, well, behold, go into the city. Man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house. Tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, where's the guest room that I may have the Passover with my disciples? And he'll show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. They want to know where to eat. Jesus says, go into town. Go find somebody carrying water. Follow him. And then ask him. And that's the place. 13, then they go and they do it. And they found it just as Jesus told them. And they prepared the Passover. Now, why does this happen? One, this happens because Jesus is hiding from the religious leaders. They're trying to catch him. They're trying to kill him. And so he's this kind of, this is almost like espionage, trying to make sure that it's sneaky and they can't find him yet. He also does it to show that he's in control. Um, they're not going to find him. They're not going to catch him. They're not going to kill him until he is ready and prepared. 14, the hour comes. He reclines at the table. The apostles are with him. And he says to them, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now I tell you I won't eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now we finally kind of get to the meal. Um, it's time to celebrate, and Jesus is excited. He cannot wait to get to this day because of what it means. And the way Jesus is talking here should tell his disciples something significant is happening. Something different is taking place. There's a change because what happens at the meal here isn't about Passover anymore. What's happening at this meal is about what Jesus is getting ready 
to do. You see, when Jesus begins the meal, he doesn't do at all what they would expect. He doesn't do what they normally do. He does not do what they have done every year throughout their whole lives. Because what they do is at Passover, it's an elaborate meal. Right? And as they eat the meal, they retell the whole story of how God saved them out of Egypt, how God took them out of slavery, how God sent the plagues, and he brought Egypt low and delivered them. You can read about the institution of Passover in Exodus um, chapter 12. They would eat the unleavened bread, and they would tell the story. They would eat bitter herbs, and they would tell the story. They would eat the specific meal, and they had to put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. And there were all these instructions about what they are to do and what they are to tell and what they are to tell their children when their children ask, why do we do this? Why after we eat this? And at each step, they tell this story, explain what each part symbolizes and what it means. Jesus is not doing any of that at all. Jesus is not talking about what God has done in the past. Jesus is talking about what he is going to do in the future. Jesus begins the meal talking about the kingdom of God. And what we need to see here is that Jesus is reinterpreting Passover. He's changing it. Normally, right, there's lots of things that they eat at this meal. Luke doesn't tell us about any of those. If you notice when you read it, the lamb is, seems to be absent, but he's not absent. He's at the head of the table leading the service. There's only two things that are mentioned. It's the bread and the cup. And the bread is not to remind them of slavery. The bread is to now remind them of Jesus' body, which he will break for them. And the cup is to remind them of Jesus' spilled blood. Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood. Jesus doesn't say, hey, remember the sheep. This isn't about Exodus and it's not about Moses anymore. And when God created Passover, when he instituted it, it was to prepare them for this moment here and now. It was like training wheels to get them ready for the day when they would get to sit and eat with Jesus. And so Jesus takes them through the Passover meal to show them what it always has really meant, what it was supposed to mean. As Christians, right, we don't celebrate Passover anymore. Christians didn't begin to celebrate Passover once a year anymore. They started to celebrate communion every single week because what God did in Exodus with Egypt was amazing, but what Jesus does at Calvary is the greatest event in all of human history. And it's much more significant. And everything that happened before was leading to this. And what God did in Exodus, he only did for the Jewish people, but when Jesus, what he does on the cross, he dies for the entire world. And Passover happened through the blood of some sheep. But at Calvary, it happens through the blood of Jesus. So communion, it's a reinterpretation of Passover. Communion is something new, but it's also something old. It's the mystery finally getting revealed. So that's our first point, is communion is a reinterpretation of Passover. Our second one is that communion remembers Jesus' death. That at communion, we are to remember Christ's death. Passover would remember and reflect on the death of the Lamb the death of the firstborn in Egypt, and how God and all those who were covered by the blood were delivered from that. But in communion, we are to sit and we are to remember Christ's death for us. 19, again, it says, he took some bread, and when he had given thanks, he breaks it. And he gives it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he breaks the bread. He tells them, break it like this and do this. And as you do it, I want you to remember my body that will be broken for you. He also tells us his body was given up for us. Because Jesus gave himself for us. Jesus willingly and gladly endured a painful, awful death on the cross for you. Nobody forced him to do it. Nobody made him, nobody blackmailed him into it or twisted his arm. That he gave himself up freely as a gift for us. And so as we do communion, as we observe it, we are to do so in remembrance of me. That every time we observe communion, we are to remember the death of Jesus. That every time we partake of it, we have to focus there. It's the most important part. There's a lot of things about communion. I, I joke that I could have 20 points. I'm kind of exaggerating. I'm kind of not. There are a lot of different um, aspects and meaning that it really has. But the most important thing, if you get nothing else, this is about Jesus, and it's about what Jesus did and his death on the cross for us. 
I mean, every time we, we go through communion, you, you may have noticed, I try to give you a different thing to reflect on and a different part to emphasize um, to help us not get numb to it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we do it because Jesus died for us, because he broke his body for us, because he spilled his blood for us, and we need to remember it. And first, we need to think about the wall that his physical body really suffered, how it was broken for sinners. And we need, in the cup, we think of the blood that he spilled. And 20, he tells us again, you know, likewise, he takes the cup after eating it and says, this cup is poured out. It's the new covenant in my blood. The cup is a representation of the blood that spilled and leaked from the broken body of Jesus on our behalf. I don't know if we always realize the significance of the idea that our God willingly bled for us. So as you're growing up in church, we hear about, you know, the blood of Jesus so often, which is good, and we should sing about it. Um, but, you know, there's this old-fashioned idea, especially in this day, you know, the bleeding kind of shows weakness. If you're bled, it's because you're, you're hurt. Somebody caused that to happen. To be bloodied by somebody, it's they've beaten you. And yet here on the cross, the God of the universe was willing to be bloodied. He was willing to show weakness and his humility, and he's willing to bleed. For you and for me, not a little bit, not a prick on his finger. He was bleeding when he was in the garden before he even got to the cross. And then he bled it all. In his broken body and his spilled blood, why did he do this? He did this for our salvation. Right back in Passover, the angel of, of death that passed over Egypt and it killed all those who weren't covered by the blood. But some were spared who had the blood of the sheep on their doorposts. But in our day, um, death passes over and it claims everyone. But if we're covered by the blood of Jesus, the blood that he spilled, the hope is that resurrection is coming for us. Because the, the blood of Jesus, it offers forgiveness for all of our sins. Um, the blood of Christ that he spilled, it offers salvation after death. The blood of Jesus offers us eternal life. And the body and the blood of Christ, it is our only hope. And it's what we need to remember. You know, the gospel is not just something that we have to preach and proclaim to unbelievers and those who don't know Jesus. The gospel is something that we also need to hear proclaimed to ourselves. I had a friend I've told you many times before who every day would preach the gospel to himself because he needed to remember it. As Christians, we can't forget how we've earned our salvation. We can't forget the means of our salvation. It did not come through our own good works or our own awesomeness. It came through the broken body and the spilled blood of Jesus on the cross for us. And so every time that we partake, every time we eat and we drink of communion together, we do so remembering the death of our Savior. And as we do it, we proclaim the Lord's death. Each time as we eat and drink, we proclaim the gospel. 1 Corinthians 11 tells us every time we celebrate it, we are hearing it proclaimed to ourselves again. One of the essential features of communion is we are remembering Christ's death for us. Point number two, um, communion also need, recognizes Christ's presence. Communion recognizes Christ's presence. By I mean by this is that when we observe communion, Jesus is with us. Now, we know that Jesus is always with us as Christians as we uniquely um, gather together to worship him. God's word says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. I don't think that just means if two of us bump into each other at Walmart that suddenly God shows up in a unique way. Um, I, it really seems to have this idea of when we gather together as a church, and when we gather together to, to worship God and to do that as a community, their God is uniquely present. But Christ is even more uniquely present, not just when we gather together on worship, to worship him on Sunday or to proclaim his gospel. He seems to be uniquely present when we observe communion together as a body. He is miraculously and mysteriously present there. Now, the problem is when you ask how, and you ask me to explain it. That's when we can get into trouble because Jesus says, this is my body. This is the cup in my blood. We read some of um, John 6. You can read that whole chapter too. I'd encourage you to do that. Right after Jesus says that, a bunch of people say, uh, Jesus, this is really hard. How's anyone supposed to understand what you're saying? 
Um, and this is where Christians have had significant disagreements. The Reformation couldn't really be united because they fought over this particularly. They could agree on everything else except for how is Jesus present in communion. And they felt like they couldn't unify unless they agreed there. Now, on one far side of the spectrum, right, you have the Roman Catholic view of transubstantiation, um, which is a big word. It's really just the belief that um, during the service, as the priest prays and as he reads the words, that the cup and the bread um, almost literally transforms into Jesus' true body and his true blood. It might taste just like bread and it might taste just like wine, but it's not. It really is Jesus' body and it really is his blood. Now, it's one extreme, and that can sound bizarre to us here, um, and I do think it's wrong, but I think we have to acknowledge they're trying to take God's word seriously, that when Jesus says, this is my body, that's how they're trying to understand it. Now, the other extreme, on the other side, you have more of the memorial view. This is kind of the typical Baptist um, view, that even though Jesus says, this is my body, he really doesn't mean this is my body. Don't take that literally. Um, he means it's, it's like my body, or it's just symbolic of my body. We interpret it a little more spiritually. Now here we can run so far from the Catholic view, we can run into the other ditch. And if we, the way I've often heard it talked about is we can emphasize it so much how Jesus isn't present, we make it seem like he's not in the room at all with us when we're observing communion. It's as if there's nothing significant about what we're doing. My concern is that we can ignore Jesus' words because we don't understand them and they make us uncomfortable. We don't know what to do with them. A better way, and I think what we need to reckon with, is that Jesus is spiritually present with us somehow in the room when we observe communion. I think it's dangerous to try to explain the exact method by what it happens, because um, Jesus and God doesn't tell us. We just have to accept it by faith. But I think it's equally dangerous to deny that it happens, because we don't like it, or we can't explain it. I think we just have to submit and rest in the mystery. Um, this is where I've been really influenced by the reformer John Calvin, kind of his view of the spiritual presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And what I really love about his view generally, I'm not going to go into it, um, is that he's just willing to sit in the mystery. Um, he's willing to say, you know, I know that it's not transubstantiation, and I know that it's not the memorial because Jesus is here somehow. And I can't fully explain it, and I don't think I'm supposed to, and we just have to accept it and sit in the mystery. Now, if all that seems confusing, maybe think of it this way. Um, I want you to recognize that every time that we gather together as a church, and we observe communion, and we take the bread, and we eat the cup, Jesus is in the room with us. And Jesus is at the table with us in a real, significant way. I don't know how that works with the elements themselves. I don't need to know that, but I know he's at the table. I know he's present. And Jesus, because he's at the table, that's why we need to take it seriously. I think it's a, a chance for us to sit and to eat with our Savior. It's a chance to participate with him as we eat and as we drink communion. And so I want you to think about that as recognize that he is here with us, that we are eating his body and we're drinking his blood symbolically, but it's more than a symbol. Something's happening, and whatever is happening, Jesus is in the room with us too. And we don't have to understand it all, but we should be happy that he's here. Okay, when I was in college, um, there was one time I went home early to surprise my parents. It's a 24-hour drive from where I am at school, so I left a day early. I drove straight all the way through, and I knocked on the door in the morning. I didn't tell my parents, and my mom answered it. And she was very confused when I appeared. I remember one of the first things she said was just, how? How did you, what, like, what is happening? How are you here? And I said, Mom, don't worry about it. Just be happy I'm here. Surprise. I think it needs to be like that a little bit. Okay, don't ask Jesus how, and have him draw you a map and a diagram of how are you present in communion. Let's just be happy he's here with us. And let's just eat together and let's celebrate it. Don't overthink it. Um, whether he's, the Holy Spirit spiritually takes us up to him, whether he comes back, we're eating at the same table. So communion needs to recognize um, Christ's presence. Our point number four is um, in communion we receive sanctifying grace. So in communion we receive sanctifying grace. Sanctification is a word that we use a lot. I don't always explain it. Um, Sanctification, it's the process by which we become more like Jesus. Sanctification is how um, God, we slowly grow and we become less sinful and we become more holy. We become less unrighteous and more righteous. God slowly works on our hearts and he changes parts about us to make us more like him. And God uses lots of different things to sanctify us. 
One of the regular things that God uses to sanctify us is his word. It is the reason that we are encouraged to meditate on it day and night, that we should read it daily. It's because as we do so, every single time, we are being sanctified. Slowly, we are being made more like Jesus. That when we pray by ourselves on our own, when we pray gathered together, it sanctifies us. That as we sing songs of praise to God, whether we're gathered together corporately as a church or we're singing alone in your car or in the shower, it sanctifies us. That when we give, when we tithe in the church and we give to the needy, it is something that sanctifies us. And then we practice the spiritual disciplines. They sanctify us. All, all of these things, they're like exercises that work our spiritual muscles and help us grow in our faith. And so my contention is I think communion does something similar too. Um, I think that as we observe communion, as we do what God has commanded us to do, it slowly makes us more like Jesus. Just like as we read God's word, because I mean, when we do it, we read God's word. We read his instructions for us, and that sanctifies us. As we meditate on the death of Jesus, on his body that was broken, and on the blood that was spilled for us, that sanctifies us. As we proclaim and we preach the gospel and we remember and reflect on the gospel, that sanctifies us. And as we eat of the bread, as we drink of the cup together as the body of Christ, that sanctifies us. And all of that, mysteriously, through the Holy Spirit's help, makes us more like Jesus. That's kind of what I mean. Because ultimately, um, communion, it's spiritual food. Um, it strengthens and it recharges our souls. Not because it's so delicious, and not because there's so much of it, there's really very little, but because God uses it. This is a lot of what I think Jesus was getting at in John 6. If you want to see more of this, I'd really encourage you to go there. It was in our, part of it was in our call to worship. Jesus tells them in 635 that he is the living bread and the living water. And that whoever eats of him and drinks of him will never hunger or thirst again. And communion is the true blood. And communion is the true bread that we are to live by in John 6, 30, 55. And Jesus tells us that as we eat of it and as we drink of it, that we are abiding with Jesus, John 6, 56. And so communion, it is one of the ways that God provides our souls with what we need. He feeds our souls with what our hearts desire, and it sanctifies us. And as we eat of it, we become more like Jesus. So I think in communion, we receive God's sanctifying grace if we're followers of him. Point number five, our last one is communion reenacts the new covenant. Um, communion reenacts the new covenant. Some of the last things that Jesus says about communion in verse 20, he says, and likewise the cup after they have eaten said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus says, this is the new covenant. Now, to understand the new covenant, you need to understand the old covenant. Well, what's new? What's being replaced? The old covenant, that's the covenant that God made with Moses. You can call it the Mosaic covenant, the Mosaic law. The old covenant had a lot of rules. It was based on all of the law of Moses. It had explicit, sometimes complicated, long rules on everything that they did. Not just on moral actions that they were to take and what they should or shouldn't do, but there were rules about what you should eat, about what you can wear, what holidays to celebrate, and how you are to celebrate those. There's a complex system of sacrifices because sin makes us unclean. Sin makes us unworthy to stand before God, and so something has to deal with that sin. Something has to wash us clean. Something has to forgive us. And as part of the Old Covenant, they would sacrifice animals. Lots and lots of them. Over and over and over and over and over again for the forgiveness of their sins. That's the old covenant. But then Jesus came to bring the new covenant. And Jesus came to sprinkle his blood on the tabernacle and the temple to do away with the old covenant. Because the blood of Jesus was worth far more than the blood of sheep and goats and bulls. And the reason that when we observe communion, um, we drink, you know, wine or we drink grape juice instead of drinking real blood is because Jesus already spilled the real blood. We don't need any more. 
We no longer have to kill anything. We don't have to cut anything. We no longer observe Passover and kill sheep because the spotless lamb was crucified for us. And during Passover, right, they would reenact and they would act out the old covenant. They would meditate on the law and on the slain lamb. We don't do that anymore. Now we are reenacting and acting out and remembering what Jesus did for us in our place. We are remembering now that our sins can be forgiven by the body and the blood of Jesus. We remember now that there is a forgiveness for all sinners. That the new covenant tells us that there is new life to all who come to Jesus in faith. The new covenant tells us it is no longer just the Jews who are welcome, but it is all. The new covenant tells us that there are people from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation who are welcome to follow Jesus. The new covenant tells us that we can be made righteous, not by following all of the rules exactly, not by getting enough things right, but through Jesus and through what Jesus did. In the new covenant, Jesus died that we never have to die again, and in his death, he defeats death. The new covenant is a better covenant in every single way because Jesus died once and for all, for all of us. And when we partake of communion, we are not just remembering Ultimately, we are reenacting the story and how the new covenant was put into place. We are telling the story of Jesus' death on the cross, and we act it out not just with our words, but we act it out with our bodies. I think that there's something significant and meaningful and powerful about how God uses all of our senses at communion. It's not just something that we speak about and that we hear and listen to. It's not just something that we see. It's something that we can touch. It's something that we can smell. It's something that we taste. It's something that we act out with our whole souls, our whole bodies, and our whole selves. And communion is reenacting this new covenant. So where have we been this morning? Just um, a reminder. Communion is reinterprets Passover. Communion remembers Christ's death. Um, communion recognizes Christ's presence. In communion, we receive sanctifying grace. And communion reenacts the new covenant. You don't have to agree with everything that I'm, I'm saying about communion. Study God's word for yourself. Study this passage. Study 1 Corinthians 11. There's some in 1 Corinthians 10 as well. Um, John 6 is another significant passage. But my hope um, is that all of us will grow and learn to see that communion is deeply meaningful. That it is a, it's a sacred act. It's a sacrament. It's a gift. We should acknowledge it as show and and treat it like it. Um, now it's a lot to cover about communion this morning. Now we're going to transition to a time of taking communion. Um, it seems like it would be silly to talk about all the significance of communion and then not do it. And then just say, okay, let's pray and let's go home. Um, so as we approach the table, I want to invite you to meditate on some of these things. That after the elements are passed out, um, think of one of them, maybe one that, that's newer to you, maybe one of them that you don't think of as much, and reflect on it. Think about all that this means. So I'll invite you to do that as I call the, the elders up to help us pass out the elements. Well, let me, let me pray first before we do that. Lord, I, just, I thank you for your word. Um, I thank you for giving us communion. I thank you for giving us the opportunity um, to observe it together. I pray that you would bless our time together. Um, I pray that you would help us to think more seriously about what communion means and to recognize all that you've done in it. I pray this in your name. Amen. And here, benediction from the end of Numbers, chapter 6. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you, lift his countenance upon you, and give you peace. God bless you. Go in peace.